Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center's special edition of Greater Somerville. I'm Joe Lynch. Our guest today is the Massachusetts Democratic Party endorsed candidate for Attorney General Quentin Palfrey, the founder of the Voter Protection Corps, a nonprofit that works to increase voting access. Quentin Palfrey has served in two presidential administrations, first with President Obama in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and with President Biden's Department of Commerce as the acting general counsel. Quinton also served as the first chief of the health care division for the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. Quentin Palfrey is a graduate of Harvard, lives in Weston with his family, and it is my pleasure to welcome him to the Somerville Media Center. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. You're well on the campaign trail right after the convention. Thanks for coming down. Yeah, thanks for having me. Quentin. Congratulations on the endorsement, by the way. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Very well done. Um, this year was a hybrid between in-person at the convention center in Worcester and online voting. Just a few thoughts about how that went. I thought it went very well. I mean, we have spent a lot of time trying to build out a grassroots organization. We have a strong organization in all 40 state Senate districts, and so we were able to leverage that grassroots organization, both with folks in person at the convention center and uh, communicating with folks who were uh, participating remotely. Your staff had a lot to do with trying to rally the delegates and, you know, figure out which way was which on the um, online voting. I'll call it online voting. I have the pleasure of sitting at home. <laughs> I didn't go to Worcester this year. It would have been my fifth time at a convention. I have to tell you, Quentin, it is the way to go. Online voting is the way to go. I know people will miss the face-to-face, -face, but hybrids, maybe? Consider it. Um, Take a little bit, Quentin, before we get into the Q&A part of this, take a little bit more. I know that it's a short, brief bio that all of us give. Talk a little bit about your background and why you're running for attorney general. Thanks so much. So as a former assistant attorney general, I've seen firsthand how much impact the AG's office can have on people's lives. I was, as, as you mentioned, I was the first chief of the health care division at the time that we were implementing Massachusetts health reform. Um, so at that time, we were working really hard to make sure that everyone had access to high quality, affordable health care. Um, and we brought some really impactful consumer protection litigation um, to make sure that people were protect, protected during that critical time. Um, and I think that we are in a critical time right now. We've got the U.S. Supreme Court attacking our civil rights. Uh, we have a Congress that is uh, effectively dysfunctional um, and some really big challenges, the climate crisis, racial injustice, uh, attacks on our democracy, uh, gun violence. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. And I think that we've seen recently how important the states are in trying to solve some of those problems. We have a really effective attorney general office. It has a legacy of leadership on uh, civil rights, on consumer protection, on workers' rights. Um, and I'm really excited about the possibility of leveraging my experience in that office um, to try to lead the office in this important time. So needless to say, if you are successful as attorney general, your new boss, so to speak, the governor, may not be a stranger to you. Yeah, so I had the great honor to work alongside uh, Maura Healy, the current attorney general. Um, she was uh, the civil rights chief at the time that I was the health care chief. I've also had an opportunity to get to know Sonia Chang Diaz uh, along the trail. And I think either way, uh, having Democratic leadership in the corner office um, is going to be a really important uh, turning point. I think that the Baker administration has really lacked a sense of urgency in taking on big challenges, like, for example, the climate crisis, if we have a Democratic governor and a Democratic AG, I think that there's a lot that we're going to be able to do together. Let's stay with voting rights for a minute, if we can, because I know you've, you've dedicated a lot of your professional career to protection of voting rights. So let me just, let me try to paraphrase what I've written here. Um, some states, for their own self-serving reasons, are creating new requirements regarding voter registration and eligibility. Some say they are tampering with the fundamental right of our citizens, the right to vote. Your thoughts? 
Yeah, I think that our democracy is literally under attack. These um, uh, hearings on the January 6th uh, uh, insurrection have been really riveting, but also very, very frightening. And I think if you look at uh, uh, other countries that have had democratic backsliding, it looks a lot like what we're experiencing now. Um, this is a set of challenges I've been working on for many years. I got involved uh, in the 2004 election and in every presidential election since then on protecting voting rights. I think that this is an important time for Massachusetts um, to take a leadership role on protecting and preserving our democracy. And actually, we have a lot of work to do in that respect. We have a, uh, we have a, a, a lack of transparency in both the governor's office and in the legislature. You can't know how your legislature, legislators vote in committee. Um, we passed, or the legislature passed uh, a piece of legislation this week that didn't include Election Day registration. And so we have a long way to go to protect and preserve our democracy, even right here in Massachusetts. But I think that this is, an, this is a time uh, where our, dem our democracy is under attack. Um, and uh, certainly in some other states, we've seen uh, real voter suppression. We see gerrymandering. We see campaign finance problems. Um, we see a whole range of challenges to our democracy. Help me understand a little bit. I, I mean, I've read about it, but help me understand the objection to same-day registration. So I personally don't think that that is a valid objection. In 20 states and the District of Columbia, there is a, a really effective regime for elect Election Day registration. They do it very well in New Hampshire. I think that we would be able to do it here in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, our current system of having a registration cutoff has a tendency to disenfranchise otherwise eligible voters who are young people, people who move around a lot, uh, people of color, uh, disproportionately. Not because of some, uh, some legitimate need to make sure that they're eligible uh, to register and vote, but because of an arbitrary bureaucratic uh, cutoff. How do we satisfy those folks who say, but it may be open to voter fraud, I, where you have a number of people moving into a district to sway that election? Valid or not valid? I think it's not valid, and I think the experience of the 20 states and district and the District of Columbia, uh, who have been able to implement uh, voter, election day registration very effectively, uh, shows that it can be done uh, without fraud. Notwithstanding Donald Trump's uh, spurious uh, claims about Massachusetts voters uh, registering and voting in New Hampshire uh, in the 2016 election, there is no evidence of uh, fraud in election day registration. Let's go a little bit to how um, current Attorney General Healy has run the office. Um, some of those programs I would say you've been in sync with and will continue should you be successful. What are some of the other things that you want to prioritize? So I think that the uh, Attorney General's office has been incredibly effective over the last few years. One of the really great things that the AG did was fight back again and again against a corrupt and immoral Trump administration. Um, but uh, the office has taken on some big challenges, has sued ExxonMobil, has sued Purdue Pharma, and the Sackler family has really stood up uh, on a national level. The AG office punches above its weight. Um, and, uh, and I'd love to build off of that legacy of leadership. I think there are some opportunities um, in this uh, period of time where Donald Trump is no longer in office um, for us to refocus some of our attention right here in Massachusetts. Um, so I care a lot about access uh, to health care. I think that we've seen the pandemic, uh, you know, some challenges to accessing health care. I care a lot about uh, racial disparities and segregation in our school system. I think that we need to um, take on uh, criminal justice reform and police oversight, corrections oversight, uh, with some real urgency. Um, and I think that we need to uh, be really aggressive in fighting against the climate crisis. This is going to determine what kind of a life our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren face. And in order to meet um, the goals uh, of, the, uh, of, of the roadmap for um, climate, um, we're going to have to be really aggressive in, uh, in moving urgently towards those kinds of reforms. Climate crisis and the protection of our laws, the institution of new laws to assist with climate crisis. I went, tried to go back and look at uh, a lot of the stuff that the current attorney general, Massachusetts attorney general, was talking about. And it was striking that she was one of the first people to start talking about using the attorney general's office in that vein. Some of the other things that you want to do 
in climate crisis um, enhancing or going after those who are adding to it. Yeah, as you mentioned, um, I was in the Biden administration on day one, and uh, President Biden issued an executive order that essentially said, wherever you are in the administration, you need to make the climate crisis a priority. And I think that that's a good model for something that we can do in the attorney general's office. Whoever winds up as being governor, you're going to push for that? Absolutely. So I think, though, that uh, in the AG office, we um, have some environmental uh, protection authorities, so suing ExxonMobil and, uh, um, and fighting back against the Trump administration, going back a little further, there was Massachusetts versus EPA, which was a landmark Supreme Court case. So there's some really direct ways that we can go after polluters. But there's also a, a real role in overseeing energy and utility uh, companies, fighting back against new fossil fuel infrastructure. There's a real need uh, to stand up for environmental justice. We know that uh, communities of color are hit worst by uh, the climate crisis, and so we need to think of this as a civil rights problem. Often, there are opportunities when you're counseling agencies and defending lawsuits uh, to try and shift the focus of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the legal advice to thinking about the, uh, fighting the climate crisis as one of the real goals. And then there's the bully pulpit. Um, there's an opportunity, really, to stand up against the Weymouth comp Compressor Station and the Peabody Peaker Plant or the Eversource Springfield Pipeline. Um, so I think that we need to use the bully pulpit in those ways as well. And then there's a uh, conversation with the legislature. We need to fight for fair free transit, for a carbon tax, for incentives to, um, uh, you know, incentivize uh, transition to truly renewable sources of energy. So I'd like it to be an all of the above kind of strategy. It's a big agenda. Let me pull one piece out of the agenda, fair free transit. Your thoughts? Yeah, I'm a big fan of, uh, of, of fair free transit. I think that we ought to be subsidizing and incentivizing uh, people doing things that are going to help uh, the climate. Uh, and also, I think that there's a, an equity aspect to this. If you can make it possible for folks to get to work, for them to uh, move around, um, that's really going to help build an economy that works for everyone. So I think both from the perspective of uh, you know our, our economic justice issues and from the perspective of the climate crisis, a fair free transit is the way to go. Let's pull another piece out of that. Um, fair free transit. When we say fair free transit, who pays for it? Well, I think that uh, we spread the costs uh, around. I think that uh, you know certainly tax, uh, you know tax money, taxpayer funding is important for those subsidies. But I also think that you can uh, change the incentives um, in the sense that uh, we can um, we can tax uh, fossil fuels differently and more, and then shift some of those resources into subsidizing uh, the kind of activity uh, that is better for the climate. It's so a carrot and stick approach. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Those that are doing the good work get rewarded. Those that are reluctant to switch over from fossil fuels have to pay more. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think that if you look at that IPCC report, if you listen to scientists at the level of urgency that we need to have in fighting the climate crisis, we can't take half measures. We really do need to uh, be uh, really aggressive in meeting these climate goals. And one of those, uh, one of those things is in our transportation sector. People's lawyer, a coin that Maura Healy is known for. Um, let's take another piece of consumer protection. We've kind of addressed some of the larger issue. Consumer protection, I noticed on your site that you are pretty much a um, uh, no holes barred when it comes to wage theft, employees' wage theft. A little bit more, as you know, one of my roles here is to enforce wage theft ordinances that we have locally. Massachusetts, how do they enforce it? What's the role of the attorney general? Yeah, so this is a very big problem. Some estimates suggest that this is about a billion dollar a year problem in Massachusetts. Um, the AG plays a really major role in enforcing the labor laws. Um, but last year, we only recovered about $750,000. Um, and so it's very much out of sync uh, with the scale of the problem. It's also a problem that disproportionately affects uh, the most vulnerable communities. Um, so 
when the first uh, policy statement that we put out in this campaign was calling on the legislature to give more powers to the attorney general's office and also give more uh, powers to uh, to workers um, to bring cases about uh, wage theft. But even with our existing authorities, uh, we can invest more in uh, enforcing ex uh, wage theft laws. Um, and uh, we need more investigators. We need to bring more cases. We need the Fair Labor Bureau to be more central to the leadership team in the attorney general's office. And so, as you say, that'll be a major uh, focus for me in the office. Uh, there was a big development yesterday. Uh, I've been a strong opponent of Uber and Lyft's effort to misclassify workers and take away their benefits. Um, the SJC yesterday struck down a ballot in an initiative that was going to be on the ballot this, uh, this fall. Um, but there is going to continue to be a lot of litigation around the question of gig workers Excuse rights. Me, Quentin, the ballot initiative was promulgated by? By Uber and Lyft and some of the, um, the tech companies. Big Motor Talks. The, yes. Want to put it on the ballot, give the marketing and the advertising and the PR spin that this is good for workers and the SJC struck it down. The SJC struck it down, exactly. It. Um, but this issue is not going away. Um, there's active litigation between the Attorney General's office and some of these companies that will extend into the next AG's term, and I will take that on vigorously. Um, the economy is shifting um, towards uh, you know more of this kind of gig work, and uh, we need to make sure that we're standing up for workers um, and making sure that they get uh, the benefits and the collective bargaining rights that they deserve. It doesn't sound, uh, uh, for those viewers that are listening, gig workers means part-time people who basically have no benefits. They're at the whim of the employer. And there are some really bad actor employers out there who I see it all the time in the restaurant industry. Withhold wages, make them work overtime with no increase in, in whatever they get. How big of an issue is it, though, in say like the construction industry where the unions are protecting the workers is that a major issue it is in the construction industry and in carpentry and all of these uh, building trades um, it is a major issue wage theft is a big problem it often involves subcontractors and uh, ends up being a, a very significant challenge it also is something um, that disproportionately affects undocumented workers who are often uh, very badly mistreated by their employers as well and so it's uh, it's important for us to be vigorous in our enforcement of those laws. We're going to wind it down a little bit here, Quentin, but um, on a lighter note, I've been asked by at least two other constitutional office seekers, do you play basketball? I don't f play very well. I play, you know, a little bit uh, playing around. I, 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 play, I play more soccer and tennis is what I play. So the reference there for the viewers is that we have a woman who is running for governor who is a very good basketball player and a woman running for lieutenant governor who is a good basketball player. You might want to hone up on that. Yeah, that. we'll have so, to work on it. Um, so at the top of the show, Quentin, I asked you, I, I spoke about the association with at least two U.S. presidents. You ready for this one? Sure. Okay. So would you care to let the viewers know what relationship you have to another U.S. president? Uh, so I'm, uh, Theodore Roosevelt is my great great grandfather, and uh, you know I'm proud of the legacy of that family. There's uh, a lot that we've uh, we've we've learned uh, through that uh, through through that history. There's also a lot that uh, you know that, that we have to own up to. Uh, there certainly was uh, some um, some some racist views in uh, in some of the the history of that family as well. And so um, you know I'm very proud of uh, some of the for, for instance trust busting. Uh, that was uh, came out of that presidency. Uh, proud of some of the conservation views, um, and uh, but at the same time, uh, just as we're all coming uh, to grips with uh, some of the structural racism and, and some of the um, racism in our history, uh, there's definitely some of that in our legacy as well. I think we've come a long way. Any of us who have been in this this country for years, my grandparents came over right around the Civil War. We, we have things that we have to recognize about our forebears, that it was a different time, views were different. We've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. 
That's absolutely. I right. thought it was an interesting fun fact when yes. I was reading well, up about it. You. I had never known that before. So, so I'm named I'm named after Quentin, who was Teddy Roosevelt's son. He was a uh, a young man who decided to join the French um, uh, in World War One before the Americans got into the war, and uh, he had bad eyesight, uh, which is not great for an airplane uh, well, pilot, so fighter Teddy pilot. Teddy and, had bad well, eyesight. Well, that's absolutely too. right. And uh, so he was actually shot down uh, over France uh, in the war and is buried uh, in France, and the story is that he uh, was—that uh, that really uh, Quentin's death was, was really the, the thing that broke uh, Teddy. Uh, so. There you go. Anything before we close, Quentin? No, thanks your, so much your, for having me. It's your a closing real statement, hopefully, um, after September, we always extend the invitation to come back. I'd be delighted. Thank you so much. Terrific. Very nice to meet you thanks again, so much for having I me. think, but Quentin. Thank you very much for tuning in. My guest has been Quentin Palfrey, the endorsed candidate from the State Democratic Party for Attorney General. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.